Thanks, Bistra. So I, what I want to talk about today is something a little bit different than what I typically have talked about with eBird with this group. Um, what I'm really interested in talking about is uh, uh, the concept of putting a name to a, an organism. And um, when we think about uh, when we think about the plethora, the growth, and the number of images that are that are being collected now, um, that that growth is not only occurring in places like Facebook, where people can show images of where they were, uh, but also in the birding community too, where there's just a huge number of images being collected um, uh, and showing different species of birds and the big question that we get at the lab of ornithology all the time is what's this photograph of the bird that I took and uh, that's probably the largest request that we get at the lab um, so what we did was we started to think about uh, using a computational sustainability approach so this is a slide from Carla about how we can, we can build a tool that would automatically identify uh, images of birds to species. Um, and and this, this, to do this, it develop, what, what's required is a, a combination of interactions between uh, the data and the ability to collect enough data and integrate that. Uh, the creation of models uh, that would allow us to make more accurate predictions based on the data that we have. And then the, the decision making, the, the vetting of the models and the data to see what new information or uh, how to improve either the models or the data. And these, these interactions go back and forth so, so the, the entire system is constantly in a flux. Um, so what I want to talk to about today is how the uh, Institute of Computational Sustainability has really informed how we do some of our work at the Lab of Ornithology. So at the lab we have the Macaulay Library and the Macaulay Library is a hundred year old natural history library uh, that collects uh, images, sounds, video, rich media uh, on the natural world. And uh, they curate now a system of images of, of birds. Uh, we also have this project called eBird. eBird engages uh, bird watchers to submit their observations. Um, these are the two pieces of data that we fit into a model. And, and then this model then allows us to take that image of the bird and give it a name. And, the, and our whole goal in, the, in this project is to, to take an image and give it a name and do it as accurately as possible. And this project we call Merlin Vision and it's a project that we're working with a group of computer scientists uh, in machine vision totally initially focused on bird identification uh, the goal in the long term will be all organisms. So we start with eBird. Every eBird location starts with a, every eBird submission starts with a specific location where the observations were made. Each of those observations has some effort information, uh, how the protocols used, how much time used, the date, um, uh, whether I, th this particular count, I was just standing there with four other observers. Um, and then the list of species and how many observations it, from each of, of those. Um, we've been able to do this now globally. This isn't a map of the world. This is just a projection of all the locations where we've collected eBird data. Right now we've, we have about five million different locations. Uh, we've collected now a third of a billion observations and Carla had some great number for how many hours? Two and a half thousand hours. Some years. Two, two. Okay. We collect a lot of data. Mostly in North America, mostly north of the equator in North America, 
but we're expanding in India, Australia, all through Asia. And what we can do now with all this data that we collect is we can build these probability of occurrence estimates. So histograms uh, predicting when you would see a certain species of bird. So uh, this is information on my backyard. And if you wanted to see a chestnut-sided warbler in my backyard, you wouldn't go there in January. But if you came there now, you'd have a pretty good likelihood of, of seeing a chestnut-sided warbler. Black poles, they're migrants, so that they appear a little bit in the spring and then longer in the fall. We can build these kinds of probability matrices for any place in the world now. So we can basically constrain any kind of a machine vision model to a, a subset of the approximate 11,000 species that we have uh, in the world now. The other thing we've done recently with eBird is we've, uh, we've allowed our participants, and there's about 350,000 of them now, to upload images with their checklists. So they embed the, the image, you just drag and drop these images in, it, the image now is tagged with all the metadata on the observation. <clears throat> and this is just an example of a screenshot. You can go to the eBird website and see these images come in. Um, and you can see, yeah, we get lots of images of birds at feeders that you can't see, like that hummingbird feeder. But we also get some really cool observations too, like really nice, nice image of a veery. <coughs> These are, these are North American shorebirds from Brazil. Um, we've collected in seven months about a million observations, uh, a million photos, uh, each of those tagged. So these photos and the eBird uh, occurrence matrix is the basis of the data that we use to build the model. The second piece that we use f uh, where we employ citizen scientists is for all these images now we select out and we have a project called Merlin where, where observers basically just volunteers go in and they, they uh, put a dot on the breast of a bird and on the beak and things like that and this is to help train the machine vision model. And we have about 15,000 people who basically go through all of these images. So this combination now of probability and these marked up images uh, we use to build the model. And the model uh, is a neural net. It's basically three neural nets. Um, they take the information about the bird. They take the probability matrix from eBird and then they give us a, a probability histogram of what, what the species is uh, that, that's reported. And um, now what we're doing with this, with this approach is taking it and applying it now in a, in, in a real setting. So uh, what we've done is we've taken all of our images uh, we've trained a model in, with uh, Google's TensorFlow uh, software package. That's given us a approximately 200 megabyte file that allows us to identify up to 400 species of birds in North America. And that's small enough now where we can put that on an iPhone um, and, uh, and then we can, I'm gonna, I, I could, I was going to show you, See me afterwards and I'll show you how this works on my phone, but uh, essentially our, our goal is that any kind of camera uh, using Wi-Fi or your iPhone connected to a scope, uh, you can take a picture and this application will identify the bird. So how good is it? This is an uh, uh, image of my iPhone. Uh, there's the Merlin Vision app. You go to the app, it's pretty simple, this is very preliminary. Um, we'll choose a photo. Uh, this is a picture of a bird that I took with my iPhone photo uh, out my, at my feeder a few months ago. 
uh, you zoom in, it's not a very good photo, but the, uh, the, the, the model actually does pretty well. A and identified that correctly. It's another bird identifies that correctly. It, we're running about 85 to 95 percent accuracy on any species of bird in North America with this. But it's not perfect. Um, <laughs> we, tried, uh, we tried to do Carla and, uh, <laughs> and identify Carla as a northern cardinal. <laughs> so we're getting there. Uh, this, is a, this is a great uh, uh, partnership. There's uh, groups from Caltech, uh, the Cornell Tep Tech Campus, Computational Sustainability in the Lab, and our funding is coming from Google and National Science Foundation. Thank you. Well, one of the really exciting pieces for us by building this software is the ability to vet those images as they come in in real time. Uh, right now we have a, we have a team of, of people who can do that and a crowdsourcing technique which allows people to go in and mark images that, that say they're misidentified. Uh, this, this process will allow us to just do it on do you use the geotag? Uh, no, because we have the we have the tags uh, within the eBird app that tells us exactly where the observations were made. We could, but we don't. But you do have geotag. Yeah, yeah, we have we have very detailed information. Most of the observations that come into eBird come through an app now. The app. All you do is say start and stop, and the app keep track, keeps track of, of how far you walked, where you walked, and we, we store that information as a track in our database. So we have that. So um, this spies the data collection obviously to places where there's no cell phone connectivity? Nope, nope, this all works uh, offline. Everything is built inside the phone itself. So. Uh, you can use it anywhere in the world. Uh, you can download, while you're online, you download a list of the birds for the area you're going to be in, and off you go. It keeps track of uh, GIS uh, information uh, within the cell. But then, and, and then upload it to your database. Once, uh, once you get, get mm -hmm. connection, you upload it to the database. Yes. So just following up on that very quickly, I used to use Merlin, I think it's wonderful, but then I couldn't use anything else on my phone because it's just... Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Merlin, we've had, we have about 950,000 downloads of Merlin. Merlin is, a, in three questions, will identify any bird in North America, and we're soon to do that uh, through Mexico, we've just translated in Spanish. We've been able to decrease the size of the files of all the images and things, which is what caused your phone to, to fill up real quickly. Um, so it, it's interesting that Merlin is second to the Bible in the number of downloads. <laughs> 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 